All right, great. Uh, greetings, everyone. Thanks for taking out of your busy schedule, wherever you are in the world, and thanks for joining. Uh, today, we have a lot to cover. Okay, so um, it's going to be an open discussion. Uh, we have uh, a special uh, guest with us uh, this today that will be presenting as well, and uh, we can dive in a bit deeper into um, our shared history as West Africans. Um, for me, my name is Akin Busari, singer, songwriter, serial entrepreneur. Um, I've been on this journey for a while now. I actually started uh, my quote unquote awakening, I'll say in 2014, I'll say 2012 there about. I got sick for a while where I had to be, uh, I had to be in bed. I couldn't really move, so I had to be indoors. So because of that, I, you know, the only thing I could do really was to read. So um, I picked up my Bible and started reading and just buying books on, um, in, you know, online Amazon at the time. And, um, you know, I'll just get the books and I'll read. So I know some of you are wondering what type of sickness. So <laughs> in, in a nutshell, it was um, chicken pox. So my uh, my third born had chicken pox. He got it at school. Uh, we didn't really know. So I was responsible for bathing him at the time. Uh, so I, you know, I was just taking care of him. You know, I noticed there was a bump on his, on his back. And, I, you know, I was a bit concerned with the bump. So... The couple of days, give it a few, day, few more days after, the bump was all over his body, all over his skin. So I realized it was chicken pox and it was too late because I've never had chicken pox. And as an adult, getting chicken pox is really, you know, so really is a bad idea. So because of that, I got chicken pox uh, from him, from my, my, my son. And because of that, I had to stay indoors because uh, I, you know, I have four, ch four children in total and a wife. So I didn't want my wife to also <laughs> catch chicken pox and my, my other children. So I had to be in, 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 in the room. So I was in the room for just by myself <laughs> for a couple of, you know, I'll say for, uh, about two weeks. Because, you know, my wife, she's always concerned. You know, she's uh, she likes to keep things, you know, clean and so on. So she would like, sand, you know, like wipe things down, wipe, you know, the chairs down, you know, just making sure I I, I don't uh, pass uh, the chicken pox to any of the uh, other family members. So because of that, I was, I didn't go to church. I couldn't go to church because I was in the room. So I was just ordering books, just reading. And I was a bit curious about my own history as a West African. So, um, you know, I started, basically my, my journey started. So some of the books I purchased, uh, some of them, I have them here, lots of books. Uh, the Bible is Black History, uh, the Africans who wrote the uh, the Bible, uh, the Jew, a Negro, and some other books. So I was just, you know, buying books and just reading them. And I, obviously I was reading my Bible too and comparing notes. And one of the things I was like, wait a minute, there are lots of similarities between the African culture and also the 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 cultural practices I was reading in the scriptures. Then I started looking at, you know, language. Um, I speak a bit of uh, a language, which I now know is Paleo Hebrew, which is the ancient, uh, you know, the original Hebrew language. Okay, I speak a little bit of that. Uh, let me take you guys back a bit, a bit further. When I was, uh, while growing up in Africa, my dad would always take us on a journey, on a road trip. Uh, all across West Africa, every time we're on summer holiday. So I'm Nigerian by birth. I grew up in Nigeria, high school in Nigeria as well. But my university, I spent in Canada. Uh, I migrated to Canada when I was a teenager. But growing up in Nigeria, my dad would always take us on a you know road trip every summer to other African countries. So I've had the privilege of living in uh, Bene Republic. Uh, you know, I'll say three months, Ghana, three months uh in a year basically so every time i'm on break summer break we will travel to different african countries um so because of that i was exposed to different languages so i know how to speak uh, a v language uh, a bit so when i was looking at some of the texts and doing my research i realized wait a minute the the names the african names actually have more meaning 
when you uh they, they make more sense when you uh when you understand that you know the the, the actual names that was used in the scriptures um when i came to that revelation i was like wow this is mind blowing then i started checking online to see if there are other people that have similar uh revelation or ideas then i stumbled on uh you know a wonderful sister sarah mazanku uh through her, her podcast and some of the videos that she's doing online, where she also, uh, I mean, she's a bit more in-depth than, than me, but she goes in a bit further into uh, the actual language and she breaks it down and everything like that. So we'll get an opportunity today to uh, to hear from her and we can also discuss and, you know, you guys are free to ask questions as well. Um, to cut the long story short, I'll share uh, my screen and basically just walk you guys through some of the things that, you know, I, I discovered while doing my research, okay? Um, and we will talk about culture, we we'll talk about, you know, other things as well. So let me just quickly show you guys this. So uh, in 2014, I couldn't really stomach it anymore when I discovered this. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you've been lied to for so many years and you discovered the truth, you'll be like, wow. So, 2014, I couldn't really stomach it anymore. So I decided to purchase tickets to go to Ghana to visit the slave dungeon. So I, I had the privilege of doing that with my uh, wife uh, and children. So I brought everybody to uh, to Ghana to be able to see uh, what some of, and experience somewhat, uh, you know, what some of our ancestors went through uh, and because of that also, I, uh, I, I don't know why this is not loading now, but because of that also, I uh, uh, did a, my DNA in 2014 as well. And I did, uh, my wife also completed hers as well. The funny thing is, I tell her, she's more Nigerian than me <laughs> because her DNA result came back 100% uh, Nigerian from my maternal uh, DNA. Mine from my paternal came back Nigerian, yes. Uh, Yoruba tribe which is accurate, but for my maternal DNA, came back 100% Akan from Ghana, right? So, you know, just to kind of, while the video is loading, I just want to show you guys some of the images. Like, if you look at this, some, this these are some of the images of the quote-unquote Hebrews, right? One of the things that stood out to me right off the bat is if you look at the hair, it takes time to be able to do this, right? Why will... Uh, an artist, you know, take their time to, you know, make sure they show like, you know, they call it cornrows or like the uh, the woolly hair to show each and every one, you know, it will be easier for the artist to just basically just straighten this, right? Uh, it's less effort. But for them to actually do this, it shows that they, they're trying to depict the actual people, uh, you know, that this happened to. Okay, um, so let me show you guys a bit more. So there are more pictures. Uh, if you look at even uh, images of Egyptians, that you know, this is not an Egyptian, but if you see like images of like Egyptians, Egyptians always paint themselves black in, and according to the the the, the theologists, they say that Egyptians are from the line of Ham, and we all know that they're from Ham, and Ham is black, right? So we know for a fact that the ancient Egyptians were black. So based on some of these things, and I started asking myself, you know, questions like, okay, if the Egyptians were black and the Israelites, you know, run to Egypt every time there's an issue or oh, the video loaded. Okay. Just to kind of show you guys. Uh, so I, I was asking myself, okay, if the Egyptians are black and we know they're black and they, yeah, and they migrated to the Nigerian in the background. But well, this is me visiting. Uh, there are other videos as well, but you know, I won't really dive in into that. So, uh, yeah, so I was, where was that? So, Egyptians are black. We know Egyptians are black. They depicted themselves as black people, right? Look at this uh, uh, sculpture, for instance. You can tell that this is this is a, a black person, and every time there's uh, any problem or anything going on in 
Israel, they always run to Egypt or they trade with the Egyptians, right? Joseph was sold by his brothers to the Egyptians. And when uh, his brothers came to Egypt, they didn't recognize him because obviously uh, his skin tone was like every other person in Egypt, right? I'm sure he was probably wearing Egyptian attire, so it was difficult for his brothers to identify him. But if he was uh, not, if, if he was white or quote unquote white, because there's nothing like being white anyways, if he was white and they were white, it would be easier for them to identify Joseph in black Egypt, you know? Um, so based on some of those uh, questions that I kept asking myself and some of the images, uh, pictures, uh, the culture, the similarities in code, you know, in some of the cultural practices, you know, I, I said to myself, I said, no, they can, this can only, we can only be the people of the book. And if you look at prophecies, you know, and other things as well, you're like, okay, wait a minute. It's all making sense. It's all making sense. So that's what started my journey into this. And, um, and honestly, it's mind blowing. Once you discover the truth, and you read the scripture in, in its uh, proper text and uh, context, everything comes to life. The other mind-blowing discovery is the, the actual language, right? The AV language, which I mentioned earlier. If you look at this, this, um, the, the, this diagram, the images that you see in front of you, the, the, these symbols are the early uh, pictograph uh, writing skills. They are the early scripts, right? Which is now called Paleo Hebrew. Then this was changed to this, right? And it was changed to this, and it's now changed to this. So you see, over the years, over different centuries, right? They've actually changed it. In essence, they say they, they've modified the original text, but the problem with doing this is the original scripts were written in the in the early uh, writings uh, scripts and texts, right? If I wake Moses up today and give Moses the modern Hebrew to read, the scripts written in modern Hebrew to read, he will not be able to read it because the, the original texts were written in the ancient Paleos writing scripts and staffs. Okay, not what we have today. So, you know, completely changed, completely changed. So why am I saying this text is ancient, is the Ivy language? I'll give you one example and I'll let uh, our guest speaker uh, dive in a little bit more and uh, we'll provide other examples. We'll talk about history first and we'll go on from there. In Ivy language, the head of a sheep is a letter. A sheep is a letter and head is ta. So the first letter is a ta, right? What the modern Hebrew today say, Aleph. Aleph, from a letter to Aleph. See the similarities? But a letter is the ancient Hebrew pictograph first letter. Okay, our ancestors use these symbols because they are day-to-day -day, uh, symbols that you know it will be easy for people to read and identify and know what it is because it's something that they use on a daily basis. If you're a shepherd, you deal with sheep. You can see them around. You know what a sheep is. So if you see this first letter, it will be easy for you to say a, a letter, a letter, right? So that is why they use it. And this, if you know, if you're if you're familiar with even the, the culture, the African culture, you know this is peas, right? Beans. We eat this a lot <laughs> on the continent. So see, this is one of another 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 symbol here, which is used on a daily basis. So some of these symbols, like a comb, and some, you know, you can tell that these are daily, these are you know, symbols that you know the common folks will, will be using on a daily basis. So it will be easier for them to put sentences together and read them. So the original text was definitely written in Paleo uh, writing, Hebrew writing scripts. So I know our guest, our guest 
uh, speaker is here, co-host. I'll just make you a co-host and then uh, you can also share your screen. Sarah Mazanko, you can introduce yourself. Great, thank you so much, um, Brother Akin and um, your lovely bride, uh, Nicole. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be on your platform. I am I am um, starstruck being that you are <laughs> A um, uh, what a happening uh, Afrobeat musician. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> thank you, thank yes. you. So, and I am so thank grateful. You. I thank Yah for all that He's doing in all of our lives, and um, that this awakening is still going on and strong, in spite of mm. all of the challenges. But there's nothing too difficult for Yah. Yeah, Absolutely. and it shall be so. All right, so my name is Seira Majanku. Uh, I am, well, <laughs> I am originally from Eveland. That's the short and sweet of it. <laughs> um, uh, so what that means is um, uh, I am from West Africa, pretty much. Um, and, um, but grew up in Ghana. Uh, I've lived in Togo, uh, in Mali, uh, and the U.S. as well. Uh, so I came to my awakening um, several years ago. <laughs> uh, but what's interesting is that all my life during my uh, upbringing, I have heard that the Eves were Israelites, but it was not... Uh, anything that was of significance to me. Um, it is part of our oral histories that are told to us by our, by our elders. Um, but you don't really make anything of it, if you know what I mean. Um, and really, I came to find that the Eves are not the only ones who have had this in their oral history. And so when I came to really know it, know it, uh, I called my grandmother and I asked her about it. And she was also not too sure because she didn't really believe it so much uh, either. Um, but then she started telling me about how her own father used to um, do his worship on Saturdays. Uh, and that was the, the traditional day of worship. For, of the most high yeah and although in our culture you know we have pantheons um but the people who worship um other deities they dedicate different days for those for the worship of those deities but when it comes to the most high yeah it's always saturday and in fact one of his I'll say nicknames is the Saturday God. <laughs> and the word for um, Saturday in Eve, in my language, which is Eve, ancient Hebrew, is last day. It's pronounced Mimledagbe, but the real, it, to really understand it, you have to pronounce it as Mamledagbe. That means the last day. So she told me he did his worship of Mauga Nosaya on Saturdays on Mimli Dagbe. And he had a sacred en enclosure that he had built out of thatch. Uh, and the door, the entrance to this enclosure was covered with a white calico, so, so pure white cloth. Uh, but the, so that was the, that's the little building in the enclosure. So in the center of the enclosure, um, he had a pot, a vessel that always had water in it. Um, and that was his vessel of purification. So before he would do his, um, he would even go into that enclosure, he made sure that he, he abstained from anything that would be considered unclean. So that would mean, you know, not touching dead bodies, uh, not having um, 
romantic affair with his wife um, and, you know, not touching unclean animals and so on and so forth. And also what was interesting uh, was that she said he stopped all his work on Friday, Friday evening because he was a farmer. So he would stop all his work and then he would uh, uh, start preparing himself for the day. And um, so in his enclosure, nobody was allowed to enter. It was just him and whatever was in that little, you know, construction he had. Nobody knew what he had in there. They all suspected that he had idols in there. Um, and in fact, his children uh, were trying to convert him to uh, European Christianity. And, to, and they only met his fierce resistance uh, for many, many years. But when he died, they went into that enclosure. They went into the little, the little hut. Um, and to their surprise, they didn't find any idols. They only found the vessel of purification in the, in the center of the enclosure. And there was no idols in there. Because their my grandmother's dad, um, according to my grandmother, always told them that he was worshiping the Most High Yah already, and that he was a son of Abraham. When they were trying to convert him to European Christianity, that was what he always um, uh, told them, and the reason he he gave them for not converting. So they found out that, yes, indeed, he was worshiping the Most High Yah. He didn't have any images. He didn't have any uh, uh, mounds in there. He didn't have uh, any idols. And then she said, at the end of his worship, he would typically sacrifice an animal, usually uh, a lamb, um, a young lamb. Uh, and then he would sprinkle the blood on they the family, so the children, the wife, and any of the the house helps, the uh, you know, the workers, which is really and my my ears uh, perked when she gave me all those details because that was that's a Levitical practice right there. He was he was practicing Levitical priesthood, where he was. Uh, observing uh these uh sabbath he was sacrificing the lamb and he was obviously doing a blood of sprinkling to atone for their sins and that was his practice and that's what she told me and i said well grandma do you realize that this is <laughs> this is biblical all this thing that you've narrated to me and she said well yeah you have really, you have opened my eyes. I now see that really it is true. And then I told her that what she described is was also described by a European anthropologist back in the 1800s in a book that he wrote about the Eve people. It's a 900 plus page book. Um, and he describes to the detail everything that my mother had, my grandmother had said. And my grandmother had never read this book. And the book was published in, uh, I believe it was 1910. But this gentleman, uh, although he was European, um, he was a missionary with the German Bre Bremen Mission House. And he spent 20 years in Eveland studying the Ewe people. And so he... Although I don't, I wouldn't give much credence to people who, other people who write about us, that book, I can say, yes, um, you know, I can at least say maybe 95% is spot on because those are verifiable facts that that gentleman wrote. All he did was do interviews with elders, not just one person. He traveled, he went to different elders and collected accounts of all uh, of most of our uh, practices, our history and the language as well. So that was really the root of my, the foundation of my awakening. Uh, and then I actually, prior to that, I, I had uh, come across videos um, and books 
by uh, others who were already awakened. And that really propelled me into researching on my own because there at, until then there was really not a lot of research, a lot of um, information out there about the other people. Uh, so it really got me digging deep um, into it. And, um, and then here we are. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. All right. So uh, that's really, really beautiful uh, story um, and history that you provided. Uh, you know, but did you uh, get to uh, tell your grandma after that, you know, and what did she, how did she feel about when you told her? <laughs> Yeah, I told she now she knows, uh, you know, 100% okay. that we are descendants okay. of the of the Israelites. Um okay. yeah, so she she's she was happy about it, <laughs> you know, and so, I got to so I do share off, right? my videos, my teachings with her as well and um she all she does is just con confirm that confirms oh, the wow. things I'm saying because my grandmother actually um also has been you know uh, observing sabbath from since before i was born when my my mother was a child uh because i think it's because she grew up seeing her father practice his worship on saturdays you know so she kind of fell into that when she accepted uh your christianity and so mm -hmm. she went with the group that was actually a Sabbath based um, church. Uh, and that's how we were raised. I grew up in a Sabbath church as well. Uh, so we observed, okay. you know, feast days and things like that as well. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice. That's really, really good. Uh, so she, your grandmother, she's still with us, right? Yes, praise you <laughs> <Okay. off. laughs> She is. Okay, amazing, amazing. All right. So I know some of the people on the, you know, on, on the Zoom meeting as well are probably wondering, okay, so why are we doing this? The, I think uh, Sarah may touched on this when we were uh, doing a, a similar session on Instagram, that the goal is not for us to convert you to Judaism. The goal is not for us to, you know, to be like those in, uh, you know, the quote unquote state of Israel. That is not the goal, right? Um, it's important for us to know who we are. I think Marcos Gavi touched on this when he said, a people without knowledge of their past history, origin, or culture is like a tree without roots, right? So um, that's one of the reasons why I, I was personally curious about this. So I'm like, it'd be nice to know, especially after doing my DNA and seeing that from my mother's side, it was saying, I can you know, and I when I talked to her and my grandmother, who's also uh, still with us, um, I when I asked her about it, she said, we've never been to Ghana. There's no history in our family ever traveling that way, right? Um, there's oral history that we migrated from, uh, quote, unquote, Middle East. Uh, Yoruba people migrated, apparently, from Morocco and the uh, Arab nations, right? And we settled in West Africa. That's why a lot of, uh, in our language, we have a lot of uh, similarities with Arabic words because we spent some time in Saudi Arabia uh, before, uh, you know, Prophet Muhammad or, you know, what they, with Muhammad and his armies uh, drove our people further into West Africa, right? So that is the oral story that I got from my mom. So when they saw the account blood type, they're like, wait a minute, and it's 100% account. They say your blood matches, your maternal blood matches 100% with the Akan people of Ghana. It was specific, um, you know, and that was a shock to them because, you know, and from doing my research, I think Sarah also touched on this on our live video that there's words that are similar between the Akan people, <laughs> the Yoruba people, you know, the Igbo people. I mean, there was even a study that I saw on National, National Geographic Channel uh you know that they did uh I, I don't think it was national geographic channel but you guys can google this as well where they did uh dna for uh at least six major tribes all across west africa and their conclusion uh that the conclusion they came to was they all share 99.9 percent .9 dna similarities 
So at least six tribes, the Akan tribe, the Ashanti, the Gadangwe people, the Ewe people, which uh, Seram is from, the Yoruba people of you know uh, West Africa, the Igbo people, uh, share 99.9% .9 DNA similarities. Meaning at, at a point in time, we all had the same grandparents, the same uh, you know, uh, grandparents, right? And if you read the scriptures, you see Yakobe, which we'll get, get into with the names, had uh, 12 sons, 12 sons, right? And those 12 sons obviously had children, and they had children and they migrated from different places uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and But we all have so much in common than that which separates us. Uh, all across West Africa. And another thing that is so important to, to cover now is that history tends to repeat itself, right? And if you read the scriptures properly, you realize that there was a time in history where, uh, you know, Joseph and his brothers, his brothers were not happy with him. And they sold him, you know, uh, as a slave to uh, the Egyptians. If you look at, you know, a modern uh, day now era, you will see that something similar happened. Because over the years, we've forgotten or we've lost the fact that we are the same. So because we've lost that, uh, again, going back to the identity uh, crisis that we have, because we've forgotten that we're from the same place, we turned against one another, right? And the colonial masters capitalized on that. So there was a lot of uh, civil unrest and tribal wars among us, like for instance, the Yorubas were fighting, let's say, the Igbo people. The Igbo were fighting the Aousas. The Aousas were fighting the Akan. The Akan were fighting the Ashantis. So because of that, a lot of those that were captured, um, you know, because if you're captured by a different tribe, obviously you don't speak that tribe's language. You don't speak uh, their language. So they will sell you to the, to the colonial masters. So a lot of that happened uh, all across Africa. And you can also see that happening in the scriptures. When we go to cost, uh, customs, traditions, I mean, you can't refute the fact that we practice, even to date, there are some cultural things that we do that is, you can't find it anywhere else but on the, the scriptures. A lot of people say, oh, you know, don't believe the Bible. The white man brought the Bible, but you have to understand, the scripts were written centuries apart, some of them, right? They were compiled. They transliterated, translated, changed words, changed uh, the text from Latin to Greek to different languages. They just found those scripts. They put them together. <laughs> it's like me finding different uh, manuscripts and documents, right? And just putting them together, interpreting them my own way, like I showed you guys earlier, the even the original scripts and writing skills and text and the pictograph uh, writing skills changed over the years. So they changed them. They changed so many things and they compiled them. Because they compiled them uh, in the 1600s, for instance, doesn't mean the scripture was written in the 1600s. Because I've heard people say that, you know, the Bible was is only 6,000 years old and the world is 600,000 years old. And another thing I hear people say is, oh, you know, West Africans have been living in where we are today, you know, since God created man. If that's the case, can you show me any monuments? Can you show me any buildings, any structure that was built in the first century, second century, third century? Even, in my, I can speak for the Yoruba people, for instance. Uh, all our idols, and gods that we worship today. We all, uh, Yoruba people believe in only one God, one creator, but they believe that there are different channels to get to that creator, right? So even the small gods that we worship today, all of them were like 15th century, 14th century heroes that actually lived among the people. Shango lived among the people. Oya lived among the people. Oshun lived among the people. Ogun lived among the people. The Yoruba people will tell you that these guys actually lived among the people, right? They are just heroes or brave men and women that the people wanted to celebrate and kept their, you know, to keep their legacy going. Um, 
and they they made them a deity. Like Shango, they was, Shango was a warrior. They say he spits fire from his mouth. But it doesn't mean that that was when God created us, you know, he gave us Shango. No, right? So let's go to the creator now. Why do I say life started on the continent? There's a, a thing done by National Geographic Channel. You guys can check it out. It's on YouTube. Where they themselves, scientists or the experts, came to the conclusion that life started on the continent. And the first man that got created was black. Um, I think I have a video. Uh, I can also show you guys, but you guys can also check this online as well. National Geographic Channel, first man, black. Um, and according to the Bible, modern day Bible, when you read in English, they say God named him Adam. If you ask them, what is the literal meaning of the name Adam? What is the literal meaning of the name Adam? They tell you it means mankind. But how can the name mean mankind? When God, Adam was the first man God created. What is mankind? Can somebody tell me what mankind means? But if you go back to the original Paleo-Hebrew text, the name is actually Edim. Edim. Edim, I speak Eve like I mentioned earlier, a little bit of Eve. Um, our AV sister is here today. Adim means he looks like me, which fits the text better than Adam. Because when God made the first man, the scripture actually says, God said, let's make man in our own image. And when God made man, God said, he looks like me. That is what Adim means. With Eve also, if you ask the modern uh, Hebrews, what does Eve mean? They will tell you, giver of life. How can Eve mean giver of life when Adam was already created? So what life was in Adam? <laughs> it makes no sense. <laughs> so I'll, with that, I'll let my sister uh, take it from here. All right. Very nicely put, uh, brother. So, you know, we just have to clarify that we have these issues, these issues with uh, the conflict of the meanings assigned with the name to the names um, and the actual meanings, and that's because of how uh, the scriptures or the words were handled. So the text that we have in what is called the Bible today, we know that it didn't start as the Bible, you know, like this uh, from the beginning. Uh, it was a number of manuscripts that were put together, right? Uh, so the text was translated. They they just translated it from one language to the other, right? And it's been translated multiple times, right? Uh, but the names were not translated. The names were mostly transliterated, which is really helpful for us, uh, the descendants of the uh, ancient Israelites uh, of ancient Yasara, because when you transliterate, you just take the name from one alphabet form and transcribe it into a different alphabet form. So if I'm telling you a story and the story is uh, it, based in France and it's, the character is Jean-Jacques, if I'm telling the story in, in English, I will still use the name Jean-Jacques. I'm not going to change the name. I'm just going to write it in, you know, for English pronunciation. Right. So that has helped because it has preserved uh, it has preserved um, uh, most of the, the forms of the name. So that's how those are kind of like pebbles for us to find our way back home. And I really sincerely believe that it was Yas doing because considering the amount of hands, the number of hands that the text has been through, you know, we should be completely lost. But Yah is so kind and so merciful that he doesn't allow us to be lost completely. Uh, so I am going to, I do have some slides that I can share, uh, brother, if that's okay with you. You're, That's great. You can share. Okay. All right. Let me yeah. share my my slides. So today's topic is why West Africans are Israelites. Um, let's see, is the sound? I don't think I have sound on my slides. Let's 
thought we were okay here. Alrighty. Just a minute. <laughs> Okay, am I being heard? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. If if people are um uh, uh putting something in the chat, I can't see it yet. Um, so um, I will address questions later. Okay, all right, very good. So why um West Africans are Israelites? Um. Uh, the name under my name is the name of my YouTube channel. That is he, uh, Hebrew Ivri Ewe Ewe, the black man. Or you can also look me up under uh, at Hebrew, the black man. Okay. And it's funny because some of our brothers who don't really like for women to be teaching, when they see Hebrew, the black man, they <laughs> they they do listen and they learn. But then, you know, yeah, <laughs> we'll just leave that there. All right. I'm the so, black man today. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm the black man today. So proceed. You're the black man. <laughs> all right. Okay. So um, we are all as a people. Whether you are, whether your 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 tribe identifies as Yoruba, uh, uh, Akan, Eve, Fon, um, um, uh, Bamileke. Uh, what have you? We are all ever people. We, the the so-called Negroes, we are ever people. And I say that because ever is not really, it's not really a proper name. Ever is the is a title of somebody. It's it's um um. Well, let me let me explain it uh through the slide, and you'll see. So the Eve has morphed over the years with all of the translations and the transliteration. Eve has morphed. So what from Eve? Then they they got Eber or Eber or Aver, and then they got Ivri, and then they got Ebreus, which I think Ebreus is Latin, uh no Greek, and then Ebreus is Latin. Hebrew is French, and then in English we say Hebrew, right? So the origin is Eve. And you can see we, in our writing, we use, these are still European letters that we are using today. This is, this way of writing Eve is from, um, this is a modern um, uh, Eve writing. It's modern Eve alphabet. It is not ancient um alphabet. Uh, this is based on Latin, this type of, um, so you have E and then you have the V sound, and then you have this backwards three. So these are all based on Latin. Okay. And it was the Germans who uh, translated our language. It actually, um, uh, Mr. Uh, West Westerman, he went about translating the languages amongst us, the so-called Negroes. Okay. Uh, how do I go back? No. Oh, there you go. Okay. So that's how come we came up with this script. Okay. So anat another phonetic spelling is hey, vav, hey. That is H, W, or V, H. The H represents an E, and sometimes it can be an A. This is in the Masoretic modern Hebrew writing. Okay, so Eve, this is what you have here. And what is very interesting is that 
you can spell it any of these ways. H-W-H, H-V-H, or H-V-H. Because the Europeans don't have the use of the V character, they usually revert to W or V. Okay, so when we're restoring names, um, we have to put these things into consideration. So with this, what you have is E-W-E, E-V-E, -E, or E-V-E. -E. And they call us all of these names. So if you go among the Eves in Ghana, they'll call themselves Ewe, E-W-E. -E. If you go among the Eves in Togo, they have French influence. They call themselves Eve, E-V-E. -E. And then among us proper, the Eves, we call ourselves Eve. Okay, our name is found in the name of the Most High. The name of the Most High is referred to as the Tetragrammaton, and they say the modern scholars tell us that it is unpronounceable, the ineffable name. Well, it is unpronounceable if you don't speak the language, if you're not, you know, if you haven't either learned to speak the language or uh, you are not a descendant of uh, those to whom the name was given. So what we have here, they will say, you'd have have hey, right? And these are the various forms of it in English. So you have Y-H-W-H, Y-H-V-H. And now that we've restored it in Eve, it is Y-H-V-H. That's you with a hook, right? And as you can see, Eve, all these forms of Eve, are in the name of the Most High. And there's a scripture that talks about that. That's Second Chronicles 7, 14. And it says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That is talking to us. That is talking to us. It is not only saying, this is not just about the people who speak Eve today, who identify as Eve people, but really this is about us, the descendants of the ancient Israelites of the 12 tribes of Yasara uh, from ancient times. And we are all, the general name for us is Eve because that name was handed down to us from our ancestor that is being called Eber or Aver. Okay. So this is, so that name was passed down to uh, Abraham after Eber, I'll just pronounce his name Eber, or I'll just say Eve actually. After ancestor Eve, Eve comes from the line of Shem. Okay. So after ancestor Eve, the, the other person that was known by this name is Abraham. And they called him Ivory. This is what we have in the translation and in the current writing. Okay. And they say Ivory in English means Hebrew. And they say it means one from beyond. That's what they say. But if you look at the root word, the root word is I vet resh, which is E V. R. So that is the root word. So this, and if you say, if you want to say child of or child in Eve, it's V. So this, this Ivri that they have is Eve V. This Ein Vetresh is Eve. And this Ein Vetresh. Yod is a baby. That means a descendant of Eber or a descendant of Eve. A descendant of Eve. Let me, I want to show you a pronunciation of this on the um, Aliyah concordance. concordance. Uh, how do I share this screen? Okay, here we are. Share with sound. Okay. All right. So this, we are on the Blue Letter Bible Concordance right now. And I've pulled up, I simply pulled up Eber. Okay. So E-B-E-R. 
okay? They will also pronounce it, the scholars will also pronounce it Haber or what have you. But this is what they say was transliterated. The transliteration is E-B-E-R. Now notice that this character here is can be a B or a V, okay? According to them. Uh, but it also, if we are restoring the names, this is the second character that also can be uh, a V. Yes, because the BV uh, uh, sound uh, can make the phonetic V as well. So this is how they say it's pronounced. Strong's H, 5677, Aver, Aver. Strong's H, 5677, Aver, Aver. Okay, so they're close enough. They say Aver. <laughs> they're close enough. They don't say Eber, right? At least. Okay, so here we have uh, the pronunciation that is used for ancestor Abraham. And it's, they say Ivri, right? Well, we are being told Ivri, but let's see a pronunciation here. Strong's H, 5680, Ivri, Ivri. Ivri is what they say. But when we restore it into back into uh, Eve ancient Hebrew, we see that what it means is Evevi, Evevi means a descendant of Eve. And Eve was a descendant of Shem. Okay. That is our lineage. All right, let me continue. Okay, so that is Eve and Ivri, um, or whichever way they want to pronounce it. All right, so that's why I say that we are all Eve. We are all Eve V because that name it's not only specific, it's not specific to those ever speaking people in West Africa. No, that name actually applies to all of the descendants of ancestor Abraham. So including the ones that it did not become Israel. But what's interesting is that biblically, when we look at the, the, um, the storyline, the people who inherited that name, Eve or Evevi, are the people who also inherited the promise, the Israelites. Uh, Abraham, uh, Abraham's other sons did not call themselves Eve, or we don't see the, the scriptures refer to them as Eve. Okay, uh, let me just plug this in here real quickly. So if you are he hearing this information for the first time and you're wondering why we are so heavily sourcing from the scriptures, I just want to clarify that before they became something called scriptures, these writings, these stories and histories and accounts were oral tradition. They were handed down orally from generation to generation before they even met ink and paper or a uh, tablet or parchment or animal skin. They were told from generation to generation. And that is still the way that we tell our histories in Africa. Uh, so do know that these are histories and customs and language of a people and a real people. They are not fictional. These are not allegories. These are not uh, uh, made up stories. These people actually existed and it's been proven archeologically and anthropologically as well. And their descendants are here today and we are some of their descendants. All right, so I'm going to talk about the other people who, in West Africa because they have maintained a lot of those histories. So the Ever-speaking people are mainly found in Ghana, Togo, uh, Southern Benin, and Southwestern Nigeria. Actually, they are more than that because they are part of the so-called Be uh, branch of, uh, of languages. But when we take a closer look at this Be branch, we find that these Be-speaking people, they are actually Ever-speaking people. Because the even the category be alone is ever in it. It means language. 
So this is just the language group of the Eve, the so-called Eve speaking people of today. Uh, so that also includes all of Benin, most of Togo, and a good chunk of uh, southwestern Nigeria, all the way into Lagos and other parts as well. Those are the ones who speak the ancient Hebrew, uh, the, the parent ancient Hebrew. We, we also have found that the rest of the Negroes, they also speak ancient Hebrew, but they speak dialects of it. And uh, the Eve language is the parent of this ancient Hebrew. That is why the parent ancient Hebrew. So that is why Brother Akin was saying, for example, that we have words that are similar in Yoruba and in Akan and in this and other languages that are the languages that are spoken by the Negroes, okay? Or let me just say the Sub-Saharan Africans, even though some people don't somehow, you know, are standing against that term. It's just the term to say that these people over here below the Sahara, you know, um, are pretty much the same people. And it's true, we are, okay? All right, so the history, like I said, is passed down through oral tradition, uh, which is retold during family gatherings and festivals. Uh, there's been min many European explorers uh, who have documented our histories and customs and language. And you can see that the, the Hebraicness is so glaring um, in their writings, but some of them wouldn't dare come out and say it boldly. And uh, one of them, is the the author that I mentioned before, the anthropologist Jacob Spieth, who who spent 20 years in Eveland. He was a pastor <laughs> and he saw these similarities. You can tell just by reading uh, the 900 pages that he wrote about us, um, but he wouldn't dare say it because there is doctrine. He was working under the Bremen Mission uh, organization, which was also um, actively teaching us West Africans that we are descendants of Ham. That doctrine is still preached within their church today. <laughs> so that's the background of that. So prior to the transatlantic slave trade and colonization, Everland stretched from Accra to Lagos. That's the Ever speaking people, okay? The Everland really is all of us. And they called it Kingdom of Judah. The Europeans called it Kingdom of Judah. During the slave, uh, the trade and colonization, it was also called the, the slave coast, okay? They called it the slave coast. But for us, it is Evenigba, simply meaning Eve land, okay? So if you are Eve, whether you are Eve speaking or you are Eve in the diaspora, or you are Eve who speaks a different uh, dialect of ancient Hebrew, ancient Eve, yes, Evenigba is your land as well, okay? All right, so this is a map uh, am I being heard? Yes. Uh, are you sharing? Because you can't see your screen. You cannot see my screen. Oh, my goodness. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. So can you show uh, the Kingdom of Judah map again? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is a map that was, um, it was released in uh, uh, 17, somebody remember, remind me the date. Um, 1747. 15, yeah. 1547 or 17. Uh, 1747, one of those. No, 1747. Mm -hmm. okay. So yes, thank you, whoever put that there. Oh, can you see my the text at the bottom? Uh, it's kind of small. It's a, oh, it's a fine print. Can you zoom out or no? Yes, I can. I'm trying to... Okay. 
All right. So, yeah. So this map was by Emmanuel Bowen. He was a cartographer. He was a big deal. This isn't just some backstreet corner, you know, dude who's trying to make a pretty penny. This guy was, if you're looking for cartographers in his time, this is the guy to go to. And he was, um, he was a royal cartographer, if I'm not mistaken, but I know he was one of the big deals. Okay, so Emmanuel Bowen, 1747, Negro Land Map. This is the title of this map. And the part that I have circled in red, um, it's labeled and it's zoomed in here on the left. Kingdom of Judah or Weda, Slave Coast. Okay, and then down here it says Weda, Judah. Okay, so this entire area was considered the slave coast if you if you look at other maps you'll see that slave coast really is from like accra in ghana all the way to lagos so that was slave coast back then back during the slavery time and that that area was known as the kingdom of judah now is that did they just do it um by happenstance is it something they just thought oh it's fun let's just put this label here absolutely not the people who initially labeled uh their map uh as kingdom or, or as judah and pointed out that they were so-called jews um in these areas were the portuguese the portuguese had a huge jewish community or let me say israelite community in portugal during the um during the um uh, uh, the persecutions, the uh, Inquisition, the Inquisition targeted mostly the Black Jews of Europe. And many of them fled to Spain and then for later on to Portugal. You see. So, and now they were, they started because of Catholicism and the Inquisition, they decided to evict them. They decided to do away with the Black Jews. Israelites in their kingdoms. And so they issued some edicts um, uh, forcing them to either convert to Catholicism, <laughs> forcing them to either con convert to Catholicism or to leave their, their territories. And those who weren't able to leave, they packed them in, in ships and dumped them on the coast of uh, the west coast of Africa. Uh, so in West Africa and also in uh, Sao Tome towards, uh, um, uh, uh, I think that's like Gabon area uh, or what have you. Uh, but that time, that time frame is also commensurate with the, the time that they established a trade post in, on uh, the Gold Coast, the Portuguese. So the Israelites in Portugal were being deported in 1492, thereabouts. The, um, the, um, in the so-called Gold Coast, the Portuguese started uh, building a sort of slave, uh, a sort of trade um, um, uh, post uh, right there in the place that is known as Elmina Castle today. And I think the date on that was 1497, just two years, two or three years before they started deporting the people. You see, and they named that place Elmina, you see. And so you can see that a lot of these, they are these posts that turn into slave dungeons along the coast also popped up around the time that they started deporting the blacks from their kingdom. So you have those Israelites also coming in, but we also have Israelites who also came in through uh, 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 exile and walking all the way into West Africa over many, many years. So you, you have those two different ways uh, that they were either deported or they came, they, they came in through exile. And the, in our oral tradition today, we talk about the exiles. All right, so this is a modern map that I found. Somebody created this and pointed here that it was the kingdom of Judah. Really, it was pretty much, you know, most of this West Africa area, okay? But it doesn't mean that there were not Israelites in the other West African uh, territories. There were definitely Israelites um, there as well. 
So I found this interesting. Uh, it was from a book called A Voyage to, to Guinea. Uh, John Atkins, uh, 1735 was when it was published. And from page 131, it says, to his women, he, and this is talking about King Agaja of Dahomey, gives entirely the privilege of making and selling a beer brewed from Indian corn pretty much in use here, called puto. If you are ever speaking, you know what this is. This is pito. This is what we call it today. We call it pito, okay? Uh, John Atkins, <laughs> he messed up one letter. So puto, he says, the king of Ardra is his potent and warlike neighbor, a populous country full of large crooms or towns, and all of them obsequious slaves who dare not to sell or buy anything without license. And, be, and both ways, he exacts a custom. It is by means of this country that so great a number of slaves are brought down to Wida and sold to the Europeans naked. Hmm. And it's interesting um, to highlight that they were being sold naked because the place that he mentioned, this uh, Ardra is called Alada. And that place is uh, to the Eastern border of um, Benin, the Republic of Benin, it's close to Nigeria. And that was an ever kingdom a long time ago. And it was invaded by Dahomey, and also there were a lot of Oyo uh, residents in that area as well. What's interesting about that kingdom was that that kingdom was known for its textile industry. They were weaving kente way back when, even before you know kente became a thing today. And in fact, there was an author um, whose name is Robin Law who studied uh, the slave coast that Robin Law has a book called uh, it's about the slave coast and it captures uh, some of these things from all the way from the 1500s all the way to the 1900s um, or the 1800s rather the late 1800s and he mentions in there that this Alada uh, place was a hub for weaving and in fact um, in the beginning of the trade uh, when they were only uh, trading goods instead of humans and not humans yet, the Portuguese were purchasing um, cotton cloth, which is what we call kente today, the woven cotton cloth. Um, and there are var var varieties of it. There are variations of it in different communities as well. So if you go with the Yoruba, they also have one that is called ashoke. Um, they... Um, there are other ethnic groups that have, you know, the, the, a similar uh, type of cloth. But this Alada cloth was being sold, it, bought by the Portuguese traders, and they would take it all the way to the Gold Coast and sell it on the Gold Coast. That was very interesting. And so these are the people that they were selling naked to the Europeans when they started trading them. That is heart-wrenching uh, to me. I can only imagine. But anyway, so our history tells us that we come uh, from, the oral tradition tells us that we come from the Northeast of Africa. This is the preserved oral tradition till today. And we, uh, so in our uh, songs and drums, we, preserve a lot of this history. So we have a lot of songs that talk about the exile from Kana. Um, and it tells us how uh, we left Kana and how we made it to the land, you know, of our hopes and dreams and all this. Uh, yes, so that's in uh, song and drumming. Uh, they preserve it till today, okay? And kana simply means the soil is fruitful. The soil yields. Kana, kana na. Okay, the soil gives, it provides, right? And that actually matches perfectly well 
uh, what the scripture says about the writing says about this the kana. Um, sorry, where sorry, they Sina. were. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Sorry to interject. Yes. I just wanted, wanted to ask you: Do you know what Canaan Canaan means? The literal meaning of Canaan. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm I'm saying. That in Eve it's you're, Kana. You're, yeah, you're giving us the the, rigid, the real meaning, right? But I'm saying, do you know what right. the modern Hebrews say Canaan is? No, I forgot. You... What did they say? <laughs> no, no, no. Go, proceed, proceed. It's okay. I just wanted oh, to know okay. if you know. If it's close oh. to the original, you know. Um, you know, we can look. We can look it up real quickly. I still have the yeah, yeah. concordance up. Okay, sure, sure. That that'll be nice. Yeah, let's let's see what what they what they claim it means. Okay, I'm looking it up now. Canaan. Mm -hmm. They say it means low land. Low land. That's what low they land. have. Yeah, <laughs> let, let me show you. Wow. The they say soil that yields. The soil that yields compared the to soil, low land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay, this is how they've transliterated it, right? And they pronounce it Kenan Kenan. And the that prefix ke means soil in Evigbe. Okay. Um if you say ke, that means the soil. Okay. So when I say kana, that means the soil provides or the soil gives. Okay. Uh but I could easily say kena or kenana. That means the soil. It means the same thing. Let's see how they pronounce it. I'm just curious. Strong's H thirty six sixty seven. Kenna Ann. <laughs> Kenna Ann. Okay. Well, it's close. I'll 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 say that. All right. Very well. Okay. I think I. I need to move this. Okay, good. Here we go. Yeah. So this is the route. This is um uh, one of the routes oh, that our we can't see the we can only see the oh, oops. <laughs> the site. Yeah. Okay, let me bring it back. Okay. So the so meaning is... the meaning from, from, from AV fits the, the scripture more because you know exactly. God promised the children. Uh, you know, of Yasara, that he will mm -hmm. take them to Canaan, that, he, you know, that he used with milk and honey, that is flowing with milk and honey. Yes. Meaning the soil is really good, it's done. So mm -hmm. the the Eve, Eve meaning actually fits the, the you know, the text more. So, yeah, proceed. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and it took two grown men to just carry a cluster, uh, a cluster of fruit right what kind yeah. of fruit would be so big <laughs> you know exactly yeah so yeah definitely the if it gives the meaning the deeper meaning so this is one of the routes that our elders say we took uh there's one that says that we went through niger into mali and then into um the through the mono river area uh, in nigeria and then back into ghana and all those stuff uh but this one also is one of them I am aware that we have brothers and sisters who believe that um, Kana was somewhere in the Congo. Um, although the Congo is a lush and fertile land, um, that does not match the scriptures of what is to happen to us because of our disobedience, the desolation of the land. Uh, that land in Congo is not desolate, but this land in ancient Kana is desolate. Um, and all that you, you can go and, and read it um, um, yeah, the, the, the scriptural evidence is massive and that does not match anywhere that we are right now, as far as, as far as what ancient Kana is. And if Congo was ancient Kana, then who are the people in present day Congo? They can't be the Israelites because we're not in the land yet. Yeah. Okay. And then I just want to plug this in there as well, uh, that Kana is not the only land that was given to the descendants of Eve. Let that sink in. 
So th for those who are saying, well, that's a small desert land and blah, blah, blah. How are we all going to fit there? Uh, yes, that's true. And that's because that's not the only land that we inherited. If you go and read Jubilees chapter eight, you will see how the lands were divided amongst the children of Shem. Togbi Seme, Seme, Shem, Shem is Seme. Now the, the land was divided among the, the uh, I'm sorry, among the children of Noah. And it says that Japheth got the cold lands in the north. So we know who's, who is there and who has always been in those areas. It tells us that Ham got the hot lands. So meaning the deserts, the arid zones. And it tells that Shem, Seme, got the land that is neither too hot, neither too cold. So it doesn't snow there and it's not desert there only. And, and it says it's at the center of the earth. And so we know that that is sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. So I just wanted to plug that in there. So just in case, you know, brothers and sisters are like, well, you know, Kana is in, is in Congo or is in South Africa or what have you. No. I, yes. Yeah. Can I also add quickly uh, that, the, you know, there's a scripture in Zephaniah, I believe it's Zephaniah 3.10, that mm -hmm. says that from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, you know, yes. I'll call my people, like my scattered people. So if you look yeah. where the rivers of Ethiopia is, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. So if it's beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, obviously it's sub-Saharan Africa and you know all the all the likes, you know. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all these places of points of sojourn, these are places that we sojourned. And these are not the only places, these are just the ones I've highlighted. Uh they all mean something in Eve language, in Evegbe, ancient Hebrew. Uh, Even the names that I'm sorry. The Naya fix your lace. Hello, who who was that? Okay. All right. I think somebody just mistakenly unmuted or something. If they it does happen again, then we'll know and we can throw them out of the meeting. Okay, so even the names that are um known as names uh Egyptian names, they are also in Evegbe. And we have to remember that we spent many years, hundreds of years in Egypt, right? Some will say 400 years and others would debate it. But whatever it is, we spent hundreds of years there. So the the uh, name that is known for, for Egypt today, we know that Egypt is not the name, but the name that is known for Egypt that they know that the scholars know that the Egyptians called themselves is Keme. And in Evegbe, Keme means people of the soil. Okay. It also means within the soil. Remember, I told you that prefix Ke and Ka, Kea, it has to do with soil. Okay. Um, and then you see the same prefix here as well, right? Ketume, which is in Sudan. They called it, they call it Khartoum. Now these days it's in Arabic, so we don't even know the name anymore. You also see this ke here, ketu, that means sand, right? Soil. Ka, kana, right? So the name is repeated, right? This name is repeated here. This name is repeated here. That's how you find people. They name the places they, they used to live and enjoy. They When they move to another place, they, they adopt the same name uh, much of the time. And then you have ke here as well, keta. Right. So you'll see that repeating itself. The biblical name that is known for Egypt is Michri. Michri simply means abstain from it. Stay away. Right. And how many times, uh, um, you know, spiritually speaking, biblically, you know, when it comes to our relationship with Yah, how many times does Yah tell his prophet to warn us against Egypt? to warn us not to go into Egypt. When um, they were being invaded, they were going to be invaded uh, in the time of Jeremiah, 
uh, they were trying to run into back into Egypt and Jeremiah warned them, prophet Jeremiah warned them not to go back into Egypt. Ebemitri, abstain from it. You understand? Yeah. And then we are also cautioned against the Egyptian lifestyle, the Egyptian, you know, indulgences and idol, idolatry, uh, uh, idol worship, idolatry. Now, this name right here that I put here in the center, um, I put it there because it features on in John Ogilvy. Now, this is Seme, okay? This is the same name as that is being pronounced as Shem in uh, by the biblical, the so-called biblical scholars, okay? Seme. Seme means Seme. That means the person that follows the law. Seme, a law-abiding person. That's the law of Yah. That's Shem. That is why Shem's descendants ended up inheriting the promise and becoming Israel. Because we have ancestors yeah. who did not deviate, who actually clung to Yah. So I'll put another plug in here. Names. Names in the Bible that our ancestors left in their oral tradition that was later written, they are not all given at birth. That is oral. That's a practice of oral tradition. It's a characteristic of oral tradition. And the names are not always the, that, the names that were given at birth. When we pass a story down from generation to generation, the person telling the story usually well the story is usually told with the name that fits whatever is going on with that character when the storyteller wants you to know something about that particular character that name of that person is going to reflect that so that is oral tradition for you and that serves to safeguard the story so the names embody the story okay all right. So the name always tells you something about the person or the place. All right. So, so quick, then we quickly, say, quickly, yeah. Quickly, I want to uh, say something about Seme as well, uh, just quickly. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So there's a border between Nigeria and Benin Republic today that is Seme, mm -hmm. Seme border, yes. right? Some of these yeah. names here are still being used today. Like there's yes. another place in Nigeria called Ketu. That right. is Ketu. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah, also Keta Ketu. in yeah. Nigeria. <laughs> it, totally, yeah. So I see it, some of these names, you know, I see, the, you know, the the meanings are, is just mind-blowing, right? Yes. Why we have a border, you said, within the law, and there's a border between the Republic and Nigeria. Mm -hmm. today, and Nigeria. That is yes. Yeah. And the people, so, so yeah, the proceed. people... Yeah, go on, brother. No, 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 I'm saying proceed, it's fine, yeah. Oh, okay. I just wanted to yeah, say that. And, yeah. and um the people who reside there are um ancient Israelites. So this seme here, that's the place, there's no place that is labeled seme on the map today. But John Ogilby labeled not just this place, but the entire he said there's a place where Jews inhabit. Now, John Ogilby, you must know, was um he was a royal cartographer and he was known for drafting the first atlas that was survey based of the first atlas of uh, England. So you can look him up. So he was not just, you know, some uh, 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 drunken sailor going up and down. No, this guy uh, was a serious dude when it comes to uh, being a cartographer, being a chronicler of the king. I think he was King. It was King Charles. He was under King Charles the Second of England. Um, so this guy was a big deal, and he said Jews in where there were Jews who were inhabiting these areas, and he said the place was called Sem Seme. Uh, he he pronounced it a little bit differently according to the writing that I read, but it's Seme. And he said it was bordered on the south by the equator. 
So this is the equator. To the north by the desert. So the desert starts around here, right? It's the arid areas, okay? To the east by the Nile, which is about here. And then to the west by the western fringes of the Dahomey Kingdom. So this, this whole area, he said Jews were here. Jews were living here. And he didn't um, find this account by him, himself. He, he actually compiled from other cartographers. He studied and saw, you know, the similarities. And, you know, this person said this, and this person found the same thing. The explorer, this explorer wrote about this, and this other one found this, found the same thing. So they check, they check out, they check each other out. And so he wrote that in his book, uh, dated uh, 1650s, uh, and it's called Africa, an Accurate Description. Okay, it's a longer title, but that's, I'll leave it there. So our elders say we went through all these places and then we um, also sojourned in Ileife, which is in Nigeria. So we know that there are Eves in Nigeria, Eve speaking people even till today in Nigeria and those who also don't speak Eve, but are in Nigeria who are also Eve people. That like a uh, uh, brother said, there's Ketu in Nigeria. And I added there is also Kana in uh, Keta in Nigeria as well. And then we have Tado. That's another place they mention. And then uh, there's Keta also here. So all of these places, you can expect that there are either Eve speaking people or people who speak dialects of Eve. Uh, and we, are, we have been told that everywhere that we sojourned, whenever we got up to leave, there was always a remnant. There were people who stayed behind and there were people who also went a different direction while the core group continued to proceed westward. Okay, so we have that. So we are aware that there are events all the way through Central Africa, in South Africa, uh, East Africa, uh, pretty much throughout the entire Sub-Saharan Africa. And you can tell because a, a lot of us have similar histories. And a lot of us have similar customs and traditions. And we have a lot of linguistic similarities as well. When you're uh, looking at comparative linguistics, what they compare is the consonants. So if there's a word in one in language A uh, and, and language B, that same word has the same consonants, the vowels may be different, but it has the same consonants then you can establish language proximity. And this is what we are finding all throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? So these are the various meanings of these locations as well. All right, we're going to move on. Uh, so the ever speaking people in uh, Ghana and Togo, they celebrate their exodus, the exiles. Okay, every year they do it. They started doing it uh, on a massive scale since the 1950s or thereabout. Yeah, I think they said 52 is when they started doing it, where they reenact the exiles. Uh, the main, the last one that is more is um, more fresh on their memory is one from a place that they have named Ngochi. And that place has a, a lot of uh, um, historical biblical significance in the sense that the name that was placed on that place actually has to do with the story of the Exodus out of Egypt. It actually mentions uh, how we were under the bondage uh, um, uh, of a wicked king um, and how we were led by a uh, someone whose name literally means the ever history <laughs> that's a name obviously that was given to him through oral tradition right uh and there was so so much detail about that you'll find the full story in my videos on youtube and other social media uh so what's interesting is that when they are performing the the march out of exile, they actually also, at some point during the dance or the march, they march backwards. And they do that because it signifies that they were wandering. They were marching backwards. 
you understand they wandered for some time before they actually ended up where they are and that has to do with the 40 years in the wilderness the Israelites, Yasara, being stuck in the wilderness, wandering about because of their own disobedience. Okay. Wait, it looks like they're carrying all their belongings and all that. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yes, they do. They carry, you know, symbolically, they'll put things, you know, things that you use at home, you know, uh, cooking utensils and anything that you will need on a journey. Uh, what's also interesting is that our foods are very much exilic foods. We don't, our, our traditional foods can be preserved for years. So that's why you see us uh, smoking our fish. So because it preserves it, we have food like gari that can Ablo. be kept. Uh, mm -hmm, Ablo. That can what is be kept. <laughs> Tell them what a blue is. <laughs> a blue means it's it means bread. Yeah, <laughs> it means it means bread, and um, there is actually a biblical significance to a blue, but that's a different. I, I we <laughs> might this might be several hours long if we go into everything, sure, sure, every sure. single thing. Sure, yeah. sure. Okay. So and then yeah, they let's... also hold a staff in their hands while um doing this demonstration yeah so this is another map and this one is labeled wayom de juda uh, and it's dated 1729 and it's this is also the bite of benin um this is west africa and it's labeled the kingdom of judah okay kingdom of judah or fida what have you all right now, this map also is very interesting. So this is an, a map of, um, it's actually uh, somewhere in Central Africa, uh, in the Congo area, we can see the, um, the equator line right here, okay? The equator is right here. And this map actually uh, coincides with what John Ogilvy had written about in his book, uh, where it says that there were Jews. Uh, so this is the the border of the of the equator the place that i i highlighted it doesn't mean that that was the only place <laughs> that that was the those were the borders i just highlighted i just circled the name okay that he has there and it says uh um you you terra it means land of jews okay this is in central africa so west central i like to consider congo all this all this area right here, whoops, all this area right here on the coast, uh, I consider it West West Africa <laughs> because we are all the same people. <laughs> okay, alrighty. Mm -hmm. And I talked about the Exodus already, so I'm not going to go into that. Now let's jump into the customs. Um, these are some customs that I have put together um, that are um, and that have references in the Bible. Okay, these practiced by our ancestors and uh, practiced still till today amongst the West Africans, the the Negroes, or let me say the Sub-Saharan African Negroes, right? Um, so, and instead of going by Negroes, we really should just go by the name Eve because that's the name of our ancestor Abraham. Mm -hmm. Okay, so patrilineal society, right? Right, you belong to the tribe of your father, not of your mother. Even till today, if you are, let's say, a woman and you are married, yeah, forbid. And let's say you're at a ripe old age and you are ready to go and in, in, into the bosom of our ancestor Abraham. Well, and you go, well, guess what? Guess who's going to bury you? It's not your husband. <laughs> it is actually your father's. Your father's house has the responsibility of burying you because you belong to your father's house. If anything should happen to you, you must be able to uh, resort to your father's house, okay? Even though, yes, your mother's house is welcoming, but it's your father's house that your, your lineage is at, okay? Yeah, so for so if, if a man, for example, 
uh, if a woman has a baby um, and let's say the father is uh, from a different nation and the, the woman is an ever lady, the father is of a different nation. And for whatever reason, the father is not claiming the child or the, the child has now become the responsibility of the woman. That child will be accepted among the Evers. That child will not be neglected. They will not be thrown away. Nothing like that. They will be loved and cherished. But what will happen is that they will not be given any inheritable positions of leadership among the Evers. They can never become king. Now, they today they are doing something like development chief. So that is somebody who has demonstrated that they have a passion to help uh, a community develop. So they will, they may you know install you as a development chief. This is happening throughout Ghana, um, but it's not it's not an inherited title. It's not an inherited chieftaincy. It's one that is given. <laughs> you are elected and then you are made a development chief. But for the king itself, you cannot be you cannot become king um, of those people if your father was not from that house. Okay from the house of the, the, from the royal house. Okay. All right. So they practice, we practice male circumcision on the eighth day uh, that, it, and you can see the scripture there, separation of women during their menses and after childbirth. The leveret marriage, a man can inherit his deceased wa a brother's wife to produce sorry, offsprings sorry. in her name. Yeah. Can I just share my screen? I want to show you something yes. quickly. Okay. Sure. So with the leverage marriage, right? right. Mm -hmm. just happened in Nigeria, right? So a governor of a state in Nigeria died not too long ago. And look at the news today. The news is, you know, late governor, Undo's governor, Undo's estate, uh, his widow, remarries his younger brother. So this just happened, you know, just to show you that, you know, we're still practicing this to date, Okay. So this just happened. You guys can even Google this. Uh, mm -hmm. It was exactly. also in the scriptures. It was also in the scriptures. Matthew 22, uh, 27 to 30, right? The disciples asked Jesus that, you know, master, if a brother marries a woman, dies, another brother marries her, dies, who's going to be the husband when they get to heaven, right? Uh, so it's in the scriptures. But if you look, nobody else is practicing this. Only sub-Saharan Africans and circumcision on the eighth day, like she said, and so many other customs and traditions that we do. Um, and it's exactly um, how it is in the scriptures. So uh, Sister Sarah, proceed. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, let me find where I am. Okay, yes. So yeah, and this levered marriage, actually, it serves as a way of protecting the woman. You may think that that's really not the case. You know, if you have to marry your 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 husband's brother, you, you feel like you would die. Well, it actually serves to protect the woman and the children because they don't want, the family does not want those children to be lost to them. If this woman should pack up and go marry another man, and yeah, forbid another man in another nation, another town altogether, what have you. Well, you know, seeing those children back into the community is, is going to be difficult. And the chances of them coming back to do something of significance among their own, their father's people is going to be difficult. It's, it's going to be low. Uh, so it serves as a way of preserving the the children into the family and also the properties so if the father had properties that the sons are inheriting well we don't want those sons to take it to another nation right we don't want the wife the woman to take her son her sons and whatever wealth you know with her to another nation so we want to keep it all in the in the family in the community now it protects the woman because you have to think in those days and even till today, among us, it is an honor to be married, to be a married woman. You are treated differently with a certain level of respect if you have a man over you, a man covering you. So for you, and, and also you have some protection. Somebody who is planning mischief with you, 
if they know that you are married, they will think twice before they do any such thing. So it serves as a way of protecting the woman and also providing for her and the children because the man is expected to provide for them, even though the women are very industrious, but the man is the main one who is the provider of the family. So this levered marriage of marrying the, the brother uh, is actually there as a protective mechanism for the woman and the children. Okay, all right, so back in those days, anyway. All right, the practice of knocking, that is the Hebraic marriage, and that is, what Sorry, was that? Your screen, your screen. Can you share your screen? I am not sharing not my sharing? screen. Oh my goodness, <laughs> Sarah. <It's okay>. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the screen share. Thank you for reminding me. It's my fault. I, I keep uh, injecting. I'm. I'm. I think I'm too yeah. excited. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Okay. All right. So the the practice of knocking. You can see the screen now. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, yes, that's the Hebraic marriage process. And that's what we call it till today. Okay. We just call it knocking. It's called hopopo. Hopopo means knocking. Okay. And you'll see the process with um, Rebecca and Isaac. I also have a video on it on my YouTube channel, uh, the ever marriage, the Hebraic ever marriage. marriage. The practice of the token of virginity. So that one um, so when the, you know, that the groom is made to pay a bride price. Okay. So when they have married, when they've done the ceremony, there's always a, there's a room that's prepared for them to consummate that marriage that night. Okay. And they would, they would lay a white calico cloth, a white cloth on the bed. Uh, and that cloth is the token, is the is the proof of her virginity. So if that cloth is stained with blood, then the man is, you know, assured that the the bride was a virgin. And in in after that, his family will pay more. <laughs> they actually will give they'll gift the lady uh, more gifts, uh, including gold. Okay. Um, I have a friend, her name is Dadaidem, and she told me about her own mother's process when um, she was confirmed to be a virgin. Uh, she was given a, a, a token uh, made of gold uh, to signify that, yes, she was uh, indeed a virgin. Okay. So the cloth when the cloth is kept by the bride's family uh, in case that the groom should come and be trying to be uh, tarnishing her name or whatever, if they had a disagreement, then the, the father or the, the fathers of the, the bride can stand up and say, no, you can't do that, sir. <laughs> we have the proof right here. Okay. So this was being practiced by the Eves. Okay. Uh, and we can see the Bible reference and um, not just the Ebers, but I've heard from other West Africans, uh, sub-Saharan Africans as well, that they have, they had this within their customs. The practice of the avenger of blood and the city of refuge. So this one was actually documented by that German anthropologist who spent 20 years among the Ebers. And he actually mentioned uh, a city that was that was actually the city of refuge um, in Everland, or one of them that was a city of refuge in Everland. Um, and uh, in the book, he mentioned how the um, the um, the what is it call it the killer would run into that city, and the avenger could not go back there and get him. So what's interesting is that a couple of years ago, there was some land that was being sold in this particular, the one that the, the anthropologist mentioned, the city that he mentioned. And it's in, it's in the uh, Ewe side of Ghana. There was some land being sold very cheap there. And I told my mother about it and I showed interest. I wanna buy some land here. I want to build something. And she says, not there. <laughs> And I said, well, why? She said, well, 
that's where bad people run to. That's where that's where bad people take refuge in the in the past. But you still can't do it because it's happened in the past. So that's going to stain the the land. <laughs> So then she dissuaded me from buying the land in that area because of the history of it being used as a city of refuge uh, and the so-called ba bad people taking refuge there. All right. Okay. So separation of the lepers. Yes. So this was a thing. Uh, and we can see it also among the ancient Israelites. Um, in fact, uh, uh, in the, I think it was the 60s or so, there was a a, a white guy that uh, when he saw how the lepers were being, um, uh, what do you call it? They were being rejected. They were being isolated. He decided to start a colony for these lepers. They did a similar thing in Nigeria as well that I know of. And I think it was in Igbo land where the Igbos also were <laughs> rejecting and isolating their lepers. So they, you know, establish a leper colony so that, you know, they will not be going through all the difficulties that they go through uh, when they are among the general population. Okay. All right. Mandatory purification right after touching dead bodies. Yes. Uh, and pouring of libation, which is a drink offering, animal sacrifice, yes. Uh, trial by God's water, uh, which is the, the, the bitter water, okay? The bitter water. So that was also being practiced, uh, is being practiced still um, among the West Africans. All right. So this was very interesting. It's something I came across recently. I told you about it a little bit uh, in our last uh, meeting, uh, FO Akin. Uh, so mm -hmm. I came across this picture on Facebook. It was on a, an other group. Um, and the caption was, what is this woman doing? And oh my goodness, come and see answers. Woo. Some the people said, dogs. she's doing juju. <laughs> <laughs> Others said she's making a voodoo doll <laughs> yeah. and all kinds of answers, right? All kinds of answers. Um, but when I look at the picture, you can see that the lady, she is spinning cotton. She's making thread, right? She's making thread. It's likely that her husband is a weaver because traditionally for the kete cloth, the men weave. The women spin the cotton. They make the thread. Okay. So she's making thread. She has a pipe in her mouth. Uh, she has her head covered, um, which is very typical among uh, sub-Saharan African women, West African women. Uh, and then this stuff she has on her body, it's not ashes. This is actually frankincense and myrrh that is mixed together. So it's used as a perfume, as a sort of perfume, this frankincense and myrrh. Um, let me, I want to, let's see how I can minimize my screen here. Nope, that's not the way. Nope. And that was gifted to Yesu. Right? It was gifted to Yesu as yes. well. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was. Let me, I'm going to, um, because I had written about it. Let's see here. Okay. So I said, um, so this is an Eve Hebrew woman spinning cotton. She is wrapped in Evedo, also known as Kete or Kente, the Hebrew cloth. So her top layer has decorative fringes. The whitish stuff on her skin is called amake. It is a mixture of frankincense and myrrh. Uh, amake is smeared on the skin for its fragrance, as well as the belief that it wards off evil spirits. It is used on babies. Yeshua was gifted frankincense and myrrh as a baby. 
and he was also gifted gold. These are these three things are actually uh, a traditional gift that you give a newborn mother, a new mother, a mother of a newborn. And um, they'll give you the frankincense and myrrh so you can make amake out of it. Uh, because it'll help the baby sleep at night, the fragrance. And then, you know, you have the added comfort of uh, believing that it wards of evil spirits as well. Okay. So it is also used in celebratory occasions, such as installment. So that's enthroning somebody, making a king or a chief. Welcoming heroes from war or from great adventures. Um, and it's given to new mothers. And also it's used on the girls during their coming of age ceremonies. They smear it on them. So this is a biblical reference about this Amake. Song of Solomon 3 verse 6 says, Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like a pillar of smoke perfumed with myrrh and frankincense with all powders of the merchants? You see the king here, this is an instrument. He is also, he also has some amake and actually he also has some powder on as well. Uh, let me bring it back. He also has, you can see on his face and on his beard, they've smeared some powder. They have some amake and powder on his body. Um, so this is, this is the tradition. This guy is being installed as a king. Okay. One of the kings uh, and this, the herbs that are around his neck. So that is our hyssop. This herb is believed to purify. So if you're doing any kind of uh, spiritual purification, the traditionalists, when they are doing any spiritual purification, they always use this herb in water to bathe. Okay. So it's believed to purify and ward off negativity. Okay. Now there is a difference between traditionalists Okay, African traditional religion practitioners and those who are seeking to follow Yah's way righteously through Yeshua. Okay, now I am talking mostly about our uh, customs, our traditions, our history and all that. So that is just the anthropological and historical level and then the linguistics. Uh, now, there's also a spiritual level of this, just like any other group of people. Eves or uh, descendants of ancient Israelites have various, you know, ways of spirituality, right? And we know the history there and how much trouble it has landed us, right? Um, when you come to those who practice African traditional religions or spiritualities today, uh, you'll find that a lot of their practices is are biblical, right? But the problem is that the one they are addressing those uh, worship to is not just Yah. They will always mention Yah in there. They will always mention the Most High in there. But then they add their other deities and all that. And that is not that that is not the way that I believe that Yah wants us to go. If you read the Bible, if you read, if you believe what your ancestors have passed on through oral tradition, uh, which is now written in something that is packaged today that is called the Bible, and it tells you that you should have no other God or Yah before Yah, <laughs> you shouldn't or beside him, you should not uh, worship other deities right? Um, it says it there over and over again. And that means it is something that is serious to our maker, right? So we have to take it seriously. So even though they practice these uh, customs and traditions, and they are very biblical, down to the T, you know, who are they addressing their worship to, right? The reason why we are in our predicament where we've been disenfranchised, we've been enslaved, we've been colonized, we've been robbed and violated in all manner of ways is just it's because we went wayward. We did not follow the instructions of Yah. We went taking on other deities everywhere that we sojourned. Before we left, we took deities with us, even till today. People will travel far and wide to go and seek some, some kind of power and come and establish it in their hometown. 
and build a shrine there and start worshiping it. It's happening till today. Our people are still doing that. So our prayers need to be strong and serious when we are praying for the deliverance of Yasara. Yasara means Israel. Uh, I, brother, I'm going to do two slides on the linguistics and then I think I, I am at my, <laughs> my, my end here. Um, I don't think I'll okay, be able great. to do all of my slides today. Um, yeah. Okay. That's so, totally fine. We can open it up for questions and, you know, just uh, yeah. open it, you know, the, for questions and so on. So, yeah, once Perfect. you finish that, we will just take questions. Okay. So, you already mentioned this uh, right here. So, I'm not going to go into that. And then um, the, uh, we, the Aleph, but the, the Paleo-Hebrew is um, Eve language, the ancient Hebrew. Okay. Now, let's look at... Mm, okay, I guess I have three slides. Okay, I'll do three slides and then we're done. Okay, and then we can do questions. Okay, so Sorry, these... can you can you go back to uh, slide seventeen? Sorry, I just want to because I I touched on it a little bit. You did. Okay, let me see. Seventeen. Uh, yeah. Just a minute. Let me. Okay. Sure. Oh, here we go. Okay, slide seventeen. Yes. Yeah, you did touch on this. Mm -hmm. So can you uh make it bigger? Yeah, the seventeen. Okay, perfect. Oh, here. So you guys oh. can see head of a sheep. A sheep. <laughs> Basically, that is what the first letter is. I just wanted to uh, you know, we yeah. Mm -hmm. Ale, mm -hmm. Ale. I didn't spell it correctly here. I tried to spell it the way that uh, uh, the diaspora would be eas would easily pronounce it, but we pronounce it Ale. Yeah, it's got something called a tilde on the E that gives it a uh kind of sound at the end. Yeah. Okay. Wait. All right. So this is an example of a name. I told you that the names have harbor the stories, right? So this is the name of Adam and brother mentioned it earlier um, that Adam is actually Edim, right? Edim means you resemble me, you look like me, right? And these names, uh, the scripture already describes it. So really we don't need to go and be trying to ascribe another meaning based on a different language. That's the problem they got into. Names are transliterated, but then they also try to ascribe a meaning based on what it sounds like in another language in this case it's mostly aramaic that's the culprit which is the relative of arabic okay all right so in genesis 1 verse 26 to 27 it says and yah said let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So Yah created man in his own image. In the image of Yah created he him. Male and female created he them. You know, it's very in interesting that he has to highlight image, his own image three times. So it means it's important. Why does it have to say in his own image in verse 26 and then say it two more times? in his own image in verse 27. Hmm. Because this is the name, this is what the name means, that he is the image of Yah, that he looks like Yah. Hmm. Okay, so let's look at the name of the woman, the first woman, which they pronounce Hawa, right? They'll, or in today they'll say Eve in English, right? Um, but if you look at the Masoretic, it, it's Hawa, which is, it's Hawa, which is uh, Chet, uh, Vav, and He, uh, which is the H sound, W, and uh, H. And I remember I told you the H can be an E or it can be an A sometimes, okay? In this case, it's an A because we can verify it with the Eve language. In the Eve language, we say Hawa, Hawa. And Hawa just means made from the side, okay? Made from side. And what does the scripture say? Genesis 2, 21 uh, and 22. 
And Yah caused a deep sleep to fall upon Edim, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which Yah had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Okay, I just did a screenshot of the interlinear and it says it right here. So this is Hawa that they are in English, they are translating as Eve. So you would wonder, well, where did they get Eve from at all? Did, did they invent it? I would say no, because this is not Eve. No. This is actually Eve. Eve. So somebody somewhere told somebody else that the name of the woman is Eve. Eve, not Eve. Eve. Eve means number two. Two. So she was the second human that Yah created. So we'll call her two. But her name also was Hawa because he, that's how Yah created her. And that's how her husband called her. So he would have called her both ways, actually. He would have called her the one that was made from my side and the second, the second to me, right, of my kind. Mm -hmm. Mm. All right, this very important name, Yasara. We've been throwing out Yasara, Yasara all this while. Why are we saying Yasara? Yasara is Israel. What you pronounce, what the world pronounce Israel is Yasara, and Yasara is Eve. In Yasara, what you have is Yah, which is the most high, and you have Sara or Asara, which means a multitude of people or a congregation of people. A multitude. So Yah's multitude. That's Yasara. That's the name Israel. But look what they say uh, Israel means. They say it means God prevails. Right? And that was based on the encounter that uh, ancestor Yaakob had with the, uh, with the being. Okay? When he wrestled with the being. Now Yasara, if you look at the root word, what you have here is S R H. Remember the H is an A or an E, right? But we verify all this with the Eve language and we see that it's Sarah. Okay, Sarah. And they also will tell you that it's Sarah, the so called scholars. And then the suffix, they put L on the suffix. That is. Um, that me that is to represent yeah. Remember, I told you the influences of the various languages on the text, right? So you have the major influences of Aramaic. They use L. L means yeah. It means God in their language, and the same with Arabic. Okay, but if you if you are looking at it from the ancient Hebrew ancient the Eve language perspective you don't need l because you already have ya in there already right in y s r a or e l right the y stands for ya the most high okay so in Eve, when we are restoring these names we don't need the l you don't because the names usually already imply ya Okay, imply the most high. All right. So, so that is yeah. it for now. Um, so, that is all I've got. Fo, I have to. I I'll be right back. Just give me two minutes, so, so, please. Not a problem. So the 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 name the names were transliterated, like uh, our sister said. Sarah in um AV language, uh, simply means congregation like a group of people, like congregation, you know? Yasara just means the congregation of Yah, you know, the congregation of Yah. So where his people are, that's where he is, you know? is where his, his people, you know, the, 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 uh, the landmass or the country doesn't mean, you know, the, the, that is where God is. That is the land God created for just himself and for his people, right? God follows his people, right? Uh, if you look, for instance, uh, when the children of Yasara were in Egypt as slaves, there was nowhere called uh, Yasara, 
right, outside of Egypt, because they were all in Egypt, captured at the time. When they were in Babylon, you know, Yasserah was in Babylon at the same time, right? So Yasserah to today, in the modern day uh, era, are in sub-Saharan Africa primarily and scattered to the four corners of this world. Because based on the scriptures, uh, you know, this, uh, the, there are prophecies in the scriptures that foretold that we will be scattered based on our disobedience. Uh, the fact that we don't obey uh, Yah's commandments. And going back to uh, my research, right, when I, uh, you know, I started my journey as for my awakening, I was looking at some, you know, some documents, you know, some documents as well. I will share my screen now and show you guys. If you see some of the names, some of the slave uh, names, quote unquote slaves, because we were not slaves, we were enslaved. Okay, but if you look at some of the names, I don't know if you guys can see uh, my screen here. You see Yahoo. You know, these are like names, you know, they all have Yah in them, right? Uh, in in, in uh, every land today, we people still bear some of these names, like Yahoo, Yahoo, Yahoo is still a name that people use today. Yema is still a name that people use today. So you see, these are names, they all have ya in them. And the other thing too that I've uh, come to uh, you know, realize, as a people, we never used to have last names, right? Um, and you see through the records that no last names here because we are known from our father's house or are called by the, you know, the occupation or you know, the, the, the trade that our family uh, does. So for instance, you know, when you read in the scriptures, when they say, oh, isn't that Yesu, the son of the carpenter, right? Uh, it's always based on the, the, the trade that the household does. Um, the concept of having last name just came to Africa. It was no, you know, like for instance, my, my last name is Busari, right? Busari is a Arab name. <laughs> it's not a Hebrew name, you know? That is probably forced on my ancestors. But my household name for my family, right, is either is uh, related to people that fought wars or is related to being a farmer because, you know, that is what my ancestors used to do. So, uh, see, it comes back full circle because if you look at some of these names, they all have ya in them, okay? With that, I mean... We'll open up the platform. If you guys have any questions, you can raise your hand and we can definitely address, uh, you know, the questions, the ones that we can answer, we can, we can, uh, you know, answer them. But if not, then we can always take it back and research. But if you read the scriptures, we look at prophecy, you read Deuteronomy 28, you will see what happened to us as a people. I know some of you are probably wondering what happened to us? <laughs> what really happened to us? You know, we messed up, we messed up. And, you know, this has been happening for years. You know, our people have been, we've, we've been slaves, you know, in Babylon, Egypt, name it, Greek. We keep, it's like, we keep repeating the same things, right? Uh, we move away from our creator and we get punished. It's as simple as that. Questions, questions. Do you guys have any questions, comments? There are books covering this thing, books, materials, lots of materials out there that you guys can read. I know uh, recently uh, there's a video trending online. I believe the president of Russia released some, uh, some old, uh, you know, artifacts and pictures and so on of like uh, the apostles and everyone painted black. And there's this uproar on social media, people arguing and fighting. But, you know, to the, to the common man, even, if you think about this, right? The son of man, you're saying that almighty God sent his son to earth to live among us. That can't walk freely under the sun, right? That will need a uh, sun uh, screen to cover his skin, to avoid uh, skin cancer. Like, those are some of the things if you think about. Like, we have melanin. 
we are protected even when we go under the sun, right? There are materials, books that you can even read and see. The Black Madonna, for instance, uh, is worshipped all across Europe. Worshipped all across Europe. Um, Miss Esther, you have your hand up. Hello, hi. I just want to say thank you for this really informative session. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, I'm just very intrigued in terms of the history because I'm originally from Ghana. My both of my parents and my dad was practicing. Um, he was Jewish. He was practicing Judaism. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think he had three. Uh, wow. I think we can trace back to like three or four um generations in terms of the male paternal side of the family practicing Judaism. What was interesting is that I have, um, we also worked out that I have um, some ancestry with the, the royal family the, of, of Ghana, so Iji, the Ijisu tribe. Um, Ya Asentwa, I'm not sure, sure I'm pronouncing her name correctly, in the early 1900s, who was um, the queen of Ijisu at the time, um, who fought the, the British, um, you know, kind of like colonial war at the time of, for the Golden Saw. Um, and I'm just kind of interested to know, know to know more about that part of my history because it's not really something I know much about. Um, all I know is that, you know, my, my, my mom and dad separated when I was very young. And I look back at the photos and I see, you know, my 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 father and my my, my brothers were in, you know, um a kipper and I'm like, what's going on? Like I didn't quite understand it. And it's later on I found out that actually, you know, he was he was Jewish. So I'm really kind of intrigued to learn about the Judaism side of you know my father, but then also the royal side, um, which came from his um his mum, the maternal side of his family were from royalty, and the paternal side were practicing um the Judaism. Amazing, uh, Sarah. I'm not sure if you can answer this. You being a Ghanaian, maybe you have a bit more um you know knowledge with regards to the the wars and the stool and so on and so forth. Yes, um, I can, but although, huh, you know, I don't, I, I prefer to stay with the uh, details in the Eves, but generally what I know is that the ethnic group, the tribe itself is called Akan. Okay. Uh, contrary to popular belief, there's no tribe called Asante. Sorry to Sorry to bust your bubble. Um, Asante is not a tribe on its own. It's not an ethnic group on its own. The tribe is a Khan and it's a huge tribe. It's a huge ethnic group that is actually in Ghana and in uh, Ivory Coast. There are Akans in Ivory Coast as well. Uh, and there are millions. I think they're like... Um, uh, is it 10 million in Ghana and then some 8 million in Ivory Coast? So it's a huge, huge tribe. Um, so the Asante actually uh, are a new formation. It's, it's a confederacy. Uh, and it came about in the 1700s. Uh, and it's a collection of various Akan uh, um, uh, sub-tribes, Akan groups, uh, who decided to come together to fortify themselves uh, for various economic and militaristic reasons. Uh, so that's where that came about. And uh, they've been very successful at creating a culture about around themselves, uh, which uh, is attributed solely to them, but truly it is the Akan culture uh, and also bits and pieces of other uh, of cultures and traditions from other ethnic groups as well. Uh, but as far as the Akans, whether they're Israelites or not, um, the Akans widely are. Now, there are some questionable groups within the Akan group, uh, the Akan ethnic groups, be, just based on their traditions and customs uh, that, you know, such as matrilineal heritage, um, which is not is you know yasara uh and also uh the uh some that don't circumcise uh among them uh some of some of the there there are some of the uh sub tribes that don't circumcise um uh, so things like that 
uh, that, you know, you would raise your eyebrow on, but there are most of the Akan groups practice all the Hebraic customs that I have mentioned. And um, they do also have varying degrees of the same history as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. You're very welcome. And the the name the name Asante um it actually means because of war. It's not it, um it it came it was yeah it was coined because of that because of that confederacy that they you know that they came together with yeah and um but the Akan there there's um there are even uh, some Akan names in the in the Bible. Uh, and the, even the name Akan, the word Akan is in the Bible as well. Yeah. But the Asante that, you know, is morphed into Ashanti today. Uh, some people like to attribute it to Ashan, uh, but that's not the same Ashan. And that Ashan didn't end well. So <laughs> we'll, just, we'll focus on the Akan, the Hebraic origins of the Akan as a, as a whole. Yeah, I think that that will actually lead you uh, to what you're looking for. Thank you. You're very welcome. Great, great, awesome. So yeah, um, we can refute some of the you know, uh, evidence and you know things that we've discussed uh, this uh, today. Uh, honestly, uh, it's just mind blowing. But it's it's a beautiful thing to be able to un unravel some of these things. Uh, you know, lies don't can you can't hide the truth forever, right? So eventually, I think more more of these things will come to light, and um, you know, and then we will be able to review more things uh, as we continue to uh, learn, and you know, with technology also, and more people will find out and know their real identity. Because I think, um, especially on the uh, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, I believe strongly that was suffering from identity crisis. You know, a lot of us don't really know who we are. We claim we do, but we we don't really know. Um, if you, our history just stops. So yeah, I'm Yoruba or I'm Igbo or I'm Arusa, and that's it. But you know, where, where are your people from? Where are your people from? Do you can you can you you know why are you practicing some of the things that you do like? some of the customs and traditions, circumcision. Why do you have to circumcise an infant baby on the eighth day after birth? Who, who gave you that instruction? Who told you to do that, right? Um, you know, and nobody knows, and we just do it. <laughs> you know, like using the sacred cloth, the virginity test uh, that you have to do when, you're, when, you, when you get married to a woman. Some of those customs and traditions, we still practice them today uh, in West Africa. Right, most of the tribes at least still practice them today, uh, but you know nobody knows. Like I just showed a a news report of a governor that just passed away, uh, but his wife is now uh, marrying his younger his younger brother. Right, it happens on a daily basis. But where did all this come from? Right, the the colonizers definitely didn't bring it bring them to Africa. Religion didn't bring them to Africa. The Catholic Church didn't bring them to Africa. Islam didn't bring some of these things to Africa. Um, so we have to just see where are all these things coming from. And then when you look at language too, I know we focus primarily on um, AV language today, uh, going through Paleo-Hebrew uh, writing scripts and so on. But if you look at other languages as well, like for instance, I speak Yoruba, but there's words in Yoruba language that when you listen carefully, you're like, wait a minute. What is the origin of this word? Why why does the word sound so so similar to another Hebrew word? For instance, we say Baba, Baba, Baba. When you listen, Baba, it sounds like Abba. Baba means father. Baba, you know, there's songs that we attribute Baba to God. When we say Baba, Baba, we worship God. Baba means father, right? But Abba, right? Words like that. When you listen carefully, you're like, wait a minute, you know. I mean, we, we can't refute some of these things, culture, traditions, language. And if you look at prophecy too, considering what happened on the continent, in West Africa, you know, our brothers and sisters taking, 
you for pain on, on your on their necks, uh, scattered worldwide to the uttermost part of the world, uh, you know, forgetting who we are, uh, even our heritage, depending on our colonial masters for pretty much everything, uh, clothing, even language. Look at the language I'm speaking right now. It's English. You know, we rely on them for everything, you know. So um, it's, it's unfortunate, but that is the situation. That is where we are now. Uh, any questions, guys? Questions, comments? How do you guys feel about this information? Are you shocked? Are you surprised? Are you excited? You know, um, I mean, when I found out about this, I had all those emo different emotions. There were days where I was, you know, I cried my eyes out. There were days where I was like so happy, excited because of the promises that await us as a people, uh, you know. And there were days where I'm just like extremely sad. So I want to know how, what you guys think. How do you guys feel about this information? Um, <laughs> Sarah, any closing thoughts? Sure. Um, I was trying to copy this link that you put here. <laughs> oh, 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 the link. Okay. Yeah, I so I can save it for later. It's a, it's a, on the genetic uh, similarities between some of the major tribes in West Africa. You know. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Yeah. You know who does a really good uh, DNA study on 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 us? It's um, Ron Dalton Jr. I don't, I'm sure oh, yeah. most of you have heard of him. Yeah, so he has um, some books out, uh, the book series, and he has movies also. Uh, they're called Hebrews to Negroes. The first one is Hebrews to Negroes, Wake Up Black America. Check it out. He has a, 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 a network also, H2N TV. I, I, I have com. the book. I have oh, the good. book, but I can't find, I think it's in my in my library, but I, 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 I actually, I see. book I bought about, I think six or seven of them. Uh, oh, I just okay. give them out to people. <laughs> so I did that before. Hey. Um, yeah. yeah, it covers a lot on that, like especially E1B1A, like the genetic mm -hmm. markers across yep. West Africa. Yep. Yeah. Really, and then really for those who are wondering, well, who are those people in the land of Kana today? Okay, well, the books and the movie answer that. I'm not going to take that exactly. on. <laughs> That's not my <laughs> ministry. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> that is not my ministry. Um, and when you read the scriptures, sometimes they, they try to, uh, you know, give you like the interpretation for it. Right. Yes. So they, you know, because they want you to see everything from their own lens. Right. So mm -hmm. if you look at like Revelation 2 9, where it says, uh, you know, those that claim to be Jews but are not. Yes. Um, if some of their scholars, like, what do you, can you interpret this scripture? Like, oh, yeah. That is just talking about spiritual Israel. But, you know, they try to make everything look like it's not what you're actually reading. But the text oh says my. those that claim to be Jews but are not, right? Um, but, you know, they try to just change it up and tell you it's spiritual and, you know, just <laughs> pray things away and go to sleep, basically. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So my closing thoughts are this. Um so yes, we are the children, we are the descendants of the ancient Eve, the Israelites, the Eve, the Yasara. We are Yasara today. And that is actually a heavy mantle. That is not just a badge to wear and say, yes, I belong to this group. No, that is a heavy mantle. That means that you are called to be set apart because you are a chosen nation. And it's a very serious duty and we must take it seriously. And so that means that our walk should be different. We should, we should be following the laws, statutes, and commandments of Yah through Yeshua. Because Yeshua is very much a, a part of our story. And in fact, uh, I didn't go into it today, maybe another time if uh, brother and uh, sister uh, will have me uh, back, uh, I could go over it, but even the name Yeshua is Eve, and it means exactly what he is for. 
Uh, and the name that we know in, amongst in West Africa today is Yesu. And Yesu is very much biblical as well. That is not a name that was given to us uh, by Europeans, you see. So, and, and Yesu actually means um, Yah is sufficient. Yah is enough. Yah is all you need. That's the meaning of Yesu. So you know where I'm going. So we cannot throw away any part of our story. We have to take the story in its totality. And we have to head in the direction that Yah is steering us. This is the whole purpose of this awakening. is so that we can be cut to right ourselves, to realize, oh my goodness, this is my condition. Do I want to be in this condition forever? No. I want my liberation. I want that day where I will be delivered out of bondage, out of Egypt, where we are. Okay, so we have to take this awakening seriously and we need to take seriously the awakening of our brothers and sisters who are not awakened. Because if we know something about Yah, the way he deals with it, with Yasara, he doesn't deal just individually. Although he does some things individually, but salvation is always collective. I've never seen him only do salvation with one person. No, the salvation is always collective from the time when he was saving us out of uh, out of Michiri, Egypt, all the way till now. So our salvation also is depending on the rest of our brothers and sisters, whether in the diaspora, uh, who are into idolatry in, very, in another form, or on the continent who are into idolatry in another form. And even ourselves, what are those things that we do that that are um, uh, uh, really taking away the attention from Yah and putting it on other deities, whether we know it or not. We have to re-examine ourselves and correct our ways so that Yah can forgive our sins and heal our land so that we can be restored and we can actually step into the promises that he has for us in Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 is not just about the, the curses. It's about the promises first. That's what Yah said. So we really have to take it seriously. I want to show you what will happen to the rest, those who have who have also worsened our our load. Um, let me share one final screen quickly. Those who have also worsened our load. This is what Yah says will happen to them. Joel chapter three. Joel chapter three from verse one to three, it says, for behold in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Yasara, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Isn't that something? And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may they might drink. Scattered my people and parted my land. You tell me who are the uh, uh, who are the people in this whole world? If you examine people groups, the people in this whole world who have been scattered deliberately, scattered everywhere, deported here, deported there, exiled here, exiled there, even till today, I myself included, the youth are still going out into other nations. I am also working hard to come back home because I don't want to, I don't want to live forever in a strange land. And I, uh, I'm so proud of uh, Brother Akim and Sister Nicole for actually making it back home and relocating. I, I, I can't wait. So we are the people so, who have been scattered deliberately. A group of brothers came together and decided this is what we're going to do to these people. Yep. And then their yep. land, our land, look at how they've divided it. What Berlin Conference. Single, exactly. Uh, 1884, they came together, yeah. these same brothers came together and decided 
this nice continent, in fact, Africa is the only continent that has a discernible shape and it has a shape of a unicorn. <laughs> a unicorn or, or uh, uh, what do you call it? The, 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 that big mammal with the horn. What do you, yeah, what is bull, the, like, yeah. the what? It's like the a bull. bull. But, yeah, but yeah, them. yeah. So they came together and decided they are going to partition this massive, beautiful center of the earth piece of land amongst themselves, mm. without regard yeah, to yeah. who who lived where. We draw our lines, and that's that. So dividing families, dividing houses, dividing tribes, they've parted the yeah. land. Of, yeah, and Yah says he's going to gather them. So I can't wait. I want this awakening to be full blown. And I want yeah. to see Yah's words come to life. Amen. Rhino, thank yeah. you. I thought, I thought that you could save me. He's a rhinoceros, yes. Rhino, yeah. In our lifetime, definitely as my prayer as well, that we should, uh, you know, we should see it, honestly. Because, um, yeah, it's been a long time coming, man. Um. They parted our land. I remember, uh, I think I was watching a video with one of the African leaders. I think it was uh, Dr. Arikana. Um, and she was saying that after the Berlin conference, there are two brothers that got up. You know, one is now in a different country and the other one is in a different country because the way they just divided the land between them, you know, it's, it's just it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And Africa is the only continent where they actually came together and decided and actually parted it. So for that, being in the scriptures that was re written centuries before that happened, it just proves that we can't joke with the scriptures. We can't joke with it. No matter what people say, I know they've translated, they've changed certain things, they've moved, you know, transliterated names and so on and so forth. But we can't deny the prophecies and you know, the word, the power that is, you know, that is in, in, in the scriptures. So, um, yeah, centuries ago, and it's written, they parted my land, scattered my people to the four corners of the world. Like, come on, what other evidence do we need? <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Right? If you guys have no, uh, if there are no other questions, then I guess we will just, uh, maybe I should, you just call on someone. Nicole, do you have anything to say? <laughs> oh, she dropped off. Okay. Azuka, any comments? Appreciate the presentation. Thank you so much. Blessings to the family. Okay, blessings. Great, great, great. Awesome. All right, guys. That's it. Till next time. Thank you all so much. Sister. I can't thank you enough. We're definitely going to connect again. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to hear you uh, teach and um, to learn from you as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you all so much for joining. And please spread the word. We are the people of the book. Tell your family members, tell your loved ones, even your enemies, tell them, let them know. We are the people of the book. The scripture is about us. It's our heritage, it's our history book. Don't let them take it away and deny you from, you know, your blessings. We are the people of the book, guys. Till next time. All right. Blessings, guys. Take care. Thank you.